It is good to be able to study together tonight. I hope you're all doing well and having a good week so far. And I hope to see most of you in person this coming Saturday for Al's memorial service. I know this doesn't apply to those of you who may be outside the Four Lakes congregation who might not have known Al. So in case you get a notification that we're getting together on Saturday, that would uh, be what that is for. But we set aside about an hour for visitation and finger food starting at 1 o'clock Saturday afternoon, and then we'll come inside for the memorial service at 2 o'clock. And then I hope to see all of you on Sunday as well. We are back to our study of 1 Thessalonians at 9.30 on Sunday morning, and we hope to wrap up our series from John 14 during the worship hour at 10.30. Tonight, we are back to the book of Genesis. Genesis, of course, is a book of beginnings written primarily by Moses. And up to this point, we've looked at the creation of everything in chapter 1, focusing in on the creation of man and woman in chapter 2, the first sin in chapter 3, the first murder in chapter 4, and the genealogy, a huge list of names in chapter 5. And that's where we left it last week. Well, this brings us to Genesis chapter 6 tonight. And in Genesis 6, we seem to have the reason for the genealogy as we seem to have a blending of the descendants of Cain and the descendants of Seth. And this is just a, a, one of the leading theories on how to handle these first few verses here. You may remember that the descendants of Cain through Lamech were primarily evil. They had some uh, amazing technological advancements, but they were uh, a ruthless people. At least Lamech was. We assume that uh, some of his descendants followed in, that, uh, followed in those footsteps. Uh, the descendants of Seth, though, seem to have a spiritual side, and there are some very good things that we can say about those descendants, as we noted last week in that long list of names in chapter 5. But with this in mind, uh, let's start with the first paragraph of Genesis chapter 6 tonight. This is Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his day shall be one hundred and twenty years." The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. And I know that there has been a lot of speculation on this passage. You've probably heard some of it. If you are somewhat familiar with the Bible, this may be familiar to you as well. Uh, the theory that angels came down from heaven and had relations with human women resulting in giants being born. That's one of the uh, big speculations that's been made on the opening verses here. But we really don't have enough information to make a leap like that just based on uh, the little bit of information that we have here. In fact, Jesus will go on to explain later that angels do not get married. And so that would certainly seem to contradict this leading theory on Genesis 6, 1 through 4. You may remember how the scribes uh, brought Jesus, as I remember it, some uh, impossibly complicated and hypothetical resurrection question involving marriage. And you may remember Jesus responded to that by saying, You are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And so angels, therefore, do not get married. So that, I think that'd be one of the big challenges to this. And I know there may be ways around this. Well, that's talking about heaven and this is here on earth and all that. Uh, but, but as we back away from uh, the speculation on these verses and as we consider the context, really, of the last couple chapters, and as we consider what's about to happen next and the rest of chapter 6 and on into chapter 7 and 8, uh, I think a much better theory, to me at least, is that Moses is referring to the godly descendants of Seth as opposed to the evil descendants of Cain through Lamech. And again, uh, there is some speculation involved with this. We just don't have enough information to, to bring a solid conclusion here. But at least it seems to me to present fewer problems than the angel theory. Uh, the way I see this then, the sons of God would be a reference to good men or godly men, and we do have several references throughout Scripture where sons of God refers to people, not angels. So this is within the realm of possibility. And then on the other hand, 
Um, the other part of this equation would be men who are evil. So uh, these good men are no longer then basing their marriage decisions on any sense of morality or this would be a good marriage partner. This is a moral a uh, woman that I'd like to live the rest of my life with, but rather they're judging uh, character based on looks alone. So they look at these women, they say, that's what I want, and they go ahead and they do whatever they want to do with no regard for God or spiritual matters at all. So that, in my opinion, that seems to present fewer challenges uh, than the idea that angels came down and had relations with humans and resulted in giants and, and all that. So we've got some translation issues going on here. There are some words that uh, can be very loosely defined and can go in several different directions, but this is the, the theory that I'm kind of leaning towards that seems to present fewer challenges. Well, the, the next question is, where does this lead? You know, if good men choose women not based on how good the women are, but simply based on how they look, very shallow way of thinking, where does that lead? Well, generally, an evil influence has a way of taking hold over time. And just generally speaking, things seem to trend toward evil. So it's kind of rare that somebody would turn away from that kind of behavior, uh, but more likely that someone would turn um, away from good toward the bad. So uh, the children born into those unions like that, they may be strong, they may be mighty, uh, they may be valiant warriors, they may accomplish great things like Lamech and his people were doing, uh, but spiritually speaking, that kind of descendant would tend to drift farther and farther away from God. And that seems to be what happens here. Uh, in verse 3, God says, As a result of this, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his day shall be 120 years. Now, earlier in my life, as I read this passage through, I kind of thought this was a reference to the shorter lifespans um, after the flood. In other words, God is saying these people are now living more than 900 years, uh, but they're evil, so no more. From now on, I'm going to limit the lifespan to 120 years. And that's the way I looked at this verse. And, and that's the way it would seem if we took it out of context, if we really didn't consider what happens over the next few chapters. So looking back on it, I don't think that's it at all. I don't think this is a reference to lifespans. Um, so the way I understand this passage now is God is giving a countdown to the flood. That's what's going on here. In other words, because of what God sees happening and where he sees these new unions heading, because you guys are doing it in this way, um, God is starting something of a countdown timer, so I don't know, a doomsday clock or however we want to say it. And, and I say this in part because of what happens next. So he's saying 120 years is what's going to bring this whole thing to an end. So I'm, I'm starting the timer on this and uh, 120 years down the road, something is going to happen. And that kind of leads us into the next paragraph. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 6 verses 5 through 8. Genesis chapter 6 verses 5 through 8. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord." Well, the situation in verse 5 is pretty bad, isn't it? In fact, it doesn't get much worse than that. It's a, a terrible picture here. I know sometimes today we talk about how evil the world is. Oh, things are terrible. It's never been worse. And and certainly things around us are bad. Uh, we have evil people in the world. Uh, many of us make evil choices uh, from time to time. But I want us to notice here, uh, maybe in the form of a question, are we able to say today that every intent of every thought of every person is only evil continually? You know, it's bad out there, but as bad as things are right now, I can't say that. I can't summarize the situation of our world today in the way that Moses describes it back then. So uh, the situation in Genesis 6 then, it's bad. I mean, it's beyond bad. It is absolutely terrible from a morality point of view. People are making some awful decisions and, you know, within a few generations, really, in the big picture, everybody had turned evil. God had given everybody complete, total freedom of choice. And I know uh, a big debate today is, are people 
uh, born with a tendency toward good or a tendency toward evil, I would say we are neutral. We are morally neutral. We have a choice freely to go in one of two very different directions. But of course, over time, um, the more time that we live, the more chance that we have of doing evil things and we end up trending toward the evil. But here in this case, uh, it is just evil to an extreme. People are thinking and doing evil things uh, all the time. Uh, in verse 6, therefore, when he sees this, the Lord is sorry that he ever made man on the earth. He was grieved in his heart. We studied this several years ago in sermon form. I think we concluded uh, back then that it's not as if God made a mistake in creating man. God did not do something wrong in creating the human race. Uh, but he certainly regrets it at this point. And I think we can understand that. There are times in our lives when we do what is right, uh, but we look back and we think, oh, you know, that resulted in some uh, difficult circumstances in my life or something like that. So God is sad about it, maybe a way of uh, putting this. And um, we have him pictured as a, as a human. He's sad in his heart. I don't know if we notice that. I don't know, you know, does God have an actual beating heart? You know, that's not the point here. Uh, but this is written in a way that we can understand. And so as a result of this uh, sadness, this regret, we might say, he decides to blot out the human race off the face of the earth. People, animals, birds, basically everything that breathes. And we'll get back to this here in a little bit tonight. But at the end in verse 8, there is a huge exception to this evil that God sees everywhere, isn't there? Uh, in the midst of all of this evil, God notices a man by the name of Noah. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So it's not that Noah is necessarily perfect. Uh, nobody's perfect. We all sin at some point in our lives. So I'm not saying Noah was perfect, but he is righteous. And it's possible to be righteous without being sinlessly perfect. Those are not synonymous. And we'll see this in the next verse, as well as in the uh, first verse of chapter seven, Noah is different from the world around him. Again, he's not perfect. Uh, but he is a righteous man. He is in a state of being right with God. He and God are okay with each other. We might put it that way. There are no outstanding issues that still need to be dealt with. Noah is trying and he's doing the best that he can. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 6 verses 9 through 12. Genesis chapter 6 verses 9 through 12 as we work our way through chapter 6. Genesis 6, 9 through 12. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. So this is where we find that Noah is righteous. This word is specifically used here at the beginning of this paragraph. As I understand it, uh, to be righteous is to be right with God. So he is blameless as well. Again, that doesn't necessarily mean sinless perfection. But if you tried to accuse Noah of something, you'd have a hard time doing that. You'd have a hard time proving that. Uh, but looking at his life, he is a righteous, blameless, upright person. And we also find that Noah, like his great-grandfather Enoch, walked with God. And as we discussed a week or so ago, he was in step with God, walking side by side in unity with God. There's a sense of unity or peace between God and Noah at this point, similar to when Adam and Eve were walking with God in the garden back before uh, the first sin. We also find here that Noah becomes the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And we're going to get back to them over the next few weeks here as well, but we're introduced to them here. In verses 11 and 12, we have another reminder that with the exception of Noah, everything is bad, isn't it? So we get back to this. Another reminder. I would describe this as a bad sandwich. So the whole world is evil in verses 5 through 8. Noah is righteous in verses 9 and 10. And the whole world is evil in verses 11 and 12. And so again, a bad sandwich. We have bad. We have righteous Noah. And then we have bad again, evil in all directions. So the righteousness of Noah, I would say, is highlighted. It is a stark contrast to an evil world. There is a stark contrast between good and evil. We have Noah, and then we have everybody else. And I'm sure we'll do this again over the next few weeks, but I'm thinking of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, where the Bible says that by faith, Noah being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence, that is, godly fear, in reverence, 
prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. And so Noah then condemned the world. And I would emphasize here, not by running around yelling at people, this isn't Noah standing on a street corner saying, all of you people are going to go to hell. That's not what's going on here, but primarily by living a righteous life while being surrounded by evil. And I think we can say the same thing about a lot of us today. Uh, just by making right decisions, by walking with God, by uh, doing good deeds, we are, in a sense, condemning the world. Not that we're out there saying, you, you, and you are going to hell. Um, it doesn't seem the Bible calls us to do that kind of thing necessarily. Uh, but like, Lo like Noah, our righteous behavior is in contrast to the world. So by living this righteous life, he actually condemned the world. And uh, that's something I think we need to note here in Genesis chapter 6. Uh, let's continue on tonight with Genesis 6, verses 13 through 16. Genesis 6, verses 13 through 16. Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms, and shall cover it inside and out with pitch, this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top and set the door of the ark in the side of it. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. So notice then God communicates his plan to Noah, at least part of it, and we'll get back to this in a little bit as well, just a partial a hint or a clue about what's coming next. He doesn't specifically mention the flood quite yet, but he starts by giving a, a reason. God doesn't always need to tell us why he does what he does, but in this case, he explains it to Noah. Basically, this is it. I've had it. The earth is full of violence and it's evil. I'm about to bring this all to an end. So I would kind of ask, associated with this, do we live in a world of violence today? Do we look around us and see violence? Absolutely we do, don't we? I mean, as a culture, we glorify violence. and It's in movies. It's in the games that we play. Uh, it's everywhere. Violence is all over the place. Absolutely. So uh, this glorification of violence in our society shows itself in actual violence. So as a culture, uh, we'll fight over just about anything, won't we? And I'm not talking about us in particular, but I'm just saying as a society, uh, people go to blows. They you know, stab and shoot each other, strangle, punch, you know, wars around the world, that kind of thing over just about anything. And to me, it's interesting that this is what God gives as one of the primary reasons for destroying the earth. It is full of violence. Everybody's hurting one another. So God, therefore, as a result of this, makes this decision. And he tells Noah to build an ark or a barge as we would probably describe it today. And um, he is to make it specifically out of gopher wood. Most translations use gopher wood as a translation here. Um, Cypress, I think the NIV, maybe the New Revised Standard, and some of the other modern translations may uh, translate this. But it's just it's one of those strange words that's only used a few times in the ancient world. Uh, we don't have a picture of the tree beside the word, so it's hard to nail that down. So cypress or gopher wood... Um, for us, the actual species of wood isn't really important. We're not the ones being told to build an ark here. Uh, but was it important for Noah to know what kind of wood to use to build the ark? Yes, absolutely it was. If God had said, build me an ark out of wood, Noah would have had freedom to use whatever wood he had available. He could have used pine, he could have used gopher, could have used whatever. Uh, but since God specified the kind of wood, Noah had to use that particular kind of wood. We don't see Noah saying, well, you know, I'm a great carpenter. And instead of gopher, I think I'm going to use oak to build this boat. That's not what Noah does here, but instead he obeys. And we'll see this over the next couple chapters. Uh, but I would suggest here that we have an example of biblical authority. God very specifically told Noah to do something. It wasn't a generic command, but he told them, uh, told him exactly how to do it. Now, as to the tools that he used, that is a matter of freedom. He didn't say, you know, build this boat only using a hammer, nothing like that. 
um, but he did specify the exact kind of wood that he was to use in building this ark. Uh, beyond this, Noah is to divide this ark into rooms, uh, divided between the three decks. I think some of the translations refer to uh, like cubby holes or, or nest or you know boxes, something like that inside the ark. It is to be covered inside and out with pitch, so like tar, if I understand that correctly, kind of to make it watertight. It is to be lined on the inside and out. And this thing is absolutely huge, isn't it? Uh, a cubit is the distance between the elbow and the tip of my finger, so roughly 18 inches. So a cubit is about 18 inches. A few years ago, Spencer got me a, uh, a cubit. I've used this in a sermon before. It's kind of written on the end here who it came from. It got a little fine print and a tiny Sharpie, and my eyes aren't that good anymore, but I know it came from him. I think it was a visit to the Ark down in Arkansas. Um, yeah, it's kind of an interesting display museum. We might say that they have down there, but I think he got that from there. I've got the box with the writing on it and all that, but it is a, an ancient cubit. And it has, there were different sizes of cubits in the ancient world. There was the Egyptian cubit and, and so on. And those are marked out here as well, as well as a hand breadth. And you got the smaller measurements. And so instead of a laser something or other, or a tape measure or a yardstick, um, they just used the, the elbow to the tip of their fingers. And that was kind of a standard in the ancient world for, for building things. So roughly 18 inches. Well, when we convert this into measurements, we might be more likely to understand uh, we find the ark is to be 75 feet wide by 45 feet tall by 450 feet long. So it is a large, large vessel, especially for the ancient world. So it is also uh, to have a window, uh, an opening for light, I think is kind of the rough translation of that word, an opening of some kind. It is to be within 18 inches of the top. And uh, some have suggested that the Hebrew language allows for one continuous opening around the top of this barge. So not necessarily a porthole. You know, if somebody says, put a window in a boat, what do we think of? I think I, in my mind, I think of the circle window, you know, in the side of a ship, that kind of thing. But that's not necessarily what uh, what's being mentioned here. So uh, build this window within 18 inches of the top. So the idea of like a a band of windows or like an opening within 18 inches of the top. And then we also learn that the ark is to have one door on the side of it. And it's kind of interesting that he doesn't say put the window on the side of it. So you see how that's a little bit different, kind of allowing for a continuous window, you know, make a window or an opening within 18 inches of the top and then put a door in the side of it. So the, the wording there is slightly different, but it is to have one door. So these are the basics. And I would note that um, what's missing on this ship, what would we expect on a ship? If we were building some kind of vessel today, what would we put on there? Well, I would kind of, you know, I'm not a, a boating type person. I do a little bit of kayaking, but uh, and a little bit of canoeing here and there. Been on a few boats and ferries through the years. Uh, but I would think some way of steering the boat might kind of be nice. Um, a rudder. Uh, no mention of a rudder here, though, is there? Um, in my opinion, if I were building a large boat, I might uh, think about putting a sail on there, some means of propulsion, or maybe holes to put oars through so we could steer our way around the world, that kind of thing. But I would just emphasize these things are missing. And then I would ask, why? Why do we not have a rudder or sails or oars or anything like that. And I think the reason is it goes back to the purpose of it. The purpose was to save uh, the human race, Noah and his family. And the purpose was to bring those animals through so they'd be able to repopulate the earth. All that boat had to do was float. And uh, it was gonna lift itself above over, you know, within the water. And then it was gonna be let down about a year later. So I'm just saying, um, there is no means of propulsion, no means of steering this thing. God is in control of this situation, but there is something that Noah needs to do. As I understand it, Noah then has roughly 120 years to get it done. Assuming God communicates this to Noah at roughly the same time, he makes the decision to send the flood, which I'm assuming he does. In 2 Peter 2.5, we have a commentary on something else Noah is doing during this time. As Peter refers to Noah as a preacher of righteousness. Noah, therefore, is preaching to the world, and I would certainly assume that he is inviting people to change their ways. He's doing a lot of explaining 
as I'm assuming he has some subcontractors and other people supplying uh, the, the supplies for creating this boat. But Noah is a preacher of righteousness, and he was also uh, apparently a man who could build a boat with God's instructions. All right, let's continue tonight with Genesis 6, verses 17 through 22. Genesis 6, verses 17 through 22. God says, Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds after their kind, and of the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing of the ground after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. As for you, take for yourself some of all the food which is edible, and gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. Thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. Well, it's not until verse 17 that God specifically tells Noah that he is planning on bringing a flood on the earth. And that's interesting to me, at least the order of this, you know, that God tells Noah to build an ark before he tells them that a flood is coming. Well, you know, maybe Noah figured that out. Maybe he didn't. Uh, you know, we probably would have said, hey, I'm going to flood the world. Therefore, build a boat. But God, though, says, build a boat. And oh, by the way, I'll be flooding the entire earth. So this may or may not be significant, but to me, at least, it's interesting that God commands obedience before he makes sure that it makes sense. Does that make sense to us? It's kind of interesting how that happens. We don't always have to understand the reason for a command before we obey the command. And I would just say that this seems to be a one example of that. Nevertheless, God's plan is to destroy everything that breathes, uh, with the exception of Noah, Mrs. Noah, their three sons, and their three wives. So a total of eight people, and he will save them by grace. Uh, this is a gift, isn't it? God certainly doesn't have to do this. God could have started all over from scratch as he did with Adam and Eve. Um, but as we learned earlier in this chapter, Noah has found favor. He has found grace in the eyes of God. He's saved by grace. Uh, but as we've already noted, Noah also has to obey. And that's where we come back to Hebrews eleven seven. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence or godly fear, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. So Noah then, in reverence, in godly fear, he prepares an ark for the salvation of his household. He does this by faith. Remember, faith comes by hearing the word of God. So God communicates, God specifies, and Noah obeys God's commandments. That is faith. Noah believes to the degree that he obeys. In addition to building the ark, Noah is to uh, bring onto the ark two of every living kind, a male and a female. A lot we could say about that. Uh, it's a controversial thing, it seems, these days. Uh, he was to bring a supply of food for he and his family, as well as for the animals. Remember, they weren't eating animals up to this point. Uh, plus, you wouldn't want to eat <laughs> an animal, right? If you brought two of every kind. You don't want to be eating animals on the ark. So they're eating plants at this point. Um, I find it interesting that God would arrange to bring the animals to Noah. Noah didn't have to go hunting all over the world, but these animals would come. God would assist in this process. But in verse 22, we find that Noah does these things. He obeys according to all that God had commanded him. So he did. Uh, by the way, this is a discussion that comes up a lot of times when we study the flood. How do we know that the flood was universal? Well, not the whole universe, but I guess worldwide. How do we know it was a worldwide flood as opposed to some local occurrence? Well, we'll get back to this. There are several other reasons why we know this, but at least one clue here at the beginning is that God commands this huge barge instead of simply telling Noah and his family to move. Okay, God is wise. Noah's smart. I mean, assuming he gives Noah 120 years, we need to realize Noah could have traveled just about anywhere on this earth over a period of 120 years. But instead, though, God tells Noah to build a giant ship. And that right there is one of our first real clues that uh, this is a worldwide flood. It is not a local occurrence. And we'll, again, we'll think of more reasons supporting this over the coming weeks. 
Well, this brings us to the end of our study tonight. Uh, next week, we hope to continue looking at the events surrounding the flood in Genesis chapter 7, so feel free to read ahead. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be together tonight. I know there are a lot of things that we could have been doing on a, on a night like this in the summer in Wisconsin, this beautiful week and all that. But uh, thank you for taking the time to study together. And I'm looking forward to getting back to it next week. Um, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the most holy God, a God of grace, a God who saves. You are a God who pays attention to violence. When one part of your creation decides to harm another, you see that and you feel for that situation. It is not something that you desire. Father, we pray that we would also pay attention to the violence that we see around us, specifically so that we would not get caught up in this culture of violence and death. We pray that as your people, we would be righteous like Noah, that we would walk with you, and that we would listen and that we would obey your commandments. Thank you, Father, for saving us and for making a way home possible. We come to you tonight in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.